Hey there, movie buffs. Ever heard of the 1968 film head? Well, buckle up because we've got some funny, shocking, and downright sad facts lined up that will keep you glued to your screen. Starring some classic Hollywood heavyweights, this film takes you on a wild ride through a series of bizarre and surreal scenes. Now, we want to know who was your favorite classic Hollywood actor in this movie. As you watch, keep an eye out for those unexpected twists and turns. The humor hits you when you least expect it, and the moments that tug at your heartstrings might just catch you off guard. It's a roller coaster of emotions that you won't want to miss. Now, we're curious what's your most cherished memory or personal experience related to this film? Drop your stories and memories in the comments below. We can't wait to hear from you. So, grab some popcorn, hit play, and let the journey begin. Get ready for a mix of laughs, shocks, and tears. Stay tuned for the unexpected and share your experiences with us. It's about to get interesting. Back in 1968, there was a groundbreaking movie that divided opinions. Some hailed its boldness and creativity, while others found it confusing. Nevertheless, it quickly found a devoted fan base, especially among those who were challenging the norms of society at the time. Its experimental style and unusual storytelling pushed the boundaries of what was expected from a film, leaving a lasting mark on culture. The soundtrack, created by the Monkees, played a significant role in boosting the movie's popularity. Songs like Porpoise Song and As We Go Along became hits in their own right, adding to the film's appeal. This collaboration between filmmakers and musicians set the stage for future projects, influencing the way music and visuals were combined in media. Since its release, the movie has inspired various spin-offs, including books, documentaries, and tribute albums. Its imagery and themes continue to influence contemporary art and entertainment, showcasing its lasting impact on culture. Collectors still seek out merchandise related to the film, such as posters and t-shirts, reflecting the ongoing appreciation for its avant-garde storytelling and its reflection of the countercultural movements of its time. In summary, this movie broke boundaries and continues to influence art and entertainment today. In a recent interview, Sean Lennon and Les Claypool talked about how a movie from 1968 inspired their music collaboration, Monolith of Phobos. They mentioned that this film is very important to them, almost like a guide for their work. In the movie, three members of a band called the Monkees planned a surprise birthday party for one of their members, Mike. What's interesting is that Mike and Davey, two members of the band, have birthdays on the same day, December 30th, even though they were born in different years. One cool thing about this movie is that it's the first time Jack Nicholson and Bob Ravelson worked together on a film. It marked the beginning of their partnership in the movie business. These connections between the movie, birthdays, and collaborations show how everything is connected and influences each other. It's like a big web of creativity shaping the music and film industries. In Ajay, California, the Monkees, along with Bob Ravelson and co-writer Jack Nicholson, brainstormed story ideas for what later became a film. Over a weekend in a resort motel, they verbally tossed ideas into a tape recorder, forming the foundation of the script. The Monkees, however, were not credited for the dialogue, as Mickey Dolenz clarified that they didn't contribute to the actual spoken lines. Dennis Hopper, known for his role in the film, took on a different role in the music world. On the Gorillaz album Demon Days, Hopper lent his narration to the song Fire coming out of the Monkees' head. A noteworthy detail about the film is its inclusion in the Criterion Collection, specifically under spine number 544. So, from a casual weekend brainstorm in Ajay to being part of the Criterion Collection, the film's journey showcases the collaborative efforts of the Monkees, Ravelson, and Nicholson, with Dennis Hopper's influence extending beyond the cinematic realm. The 1968 movie head marks the final appearance of Tor Johnson, known for his roles in B-grade horror films. John Brockman, whose likeness was used for the film's controversial ad campaign, appears exactly 78 minutes into the movie in a pose reminiscent of the campaign. Myra Machu, the actress portraying the mermaid who kisses all four members of the monkeys early in the film, was Jack Nicholson's girlfriend at the time. These details add layers to the film's production and its connections to the cultural landscape of the era. Initially running at 110 minutes, the 1968 movie underwent substantial editing due to a lackluster audience response in Los Angeles, eventually settling at a trimmed-down 86-minute version. Lee Kalama, cast as the security guard in the film, previously portrayed Yakamoto in The Spy Who Came In From The Cool and took on the role of Attila, the Hun and the Devil, and Peter Tork. Jack Nicholson makes a noteworthy appearance in the diner scene, occurring after Peter Tork engages in a physical altercation with an individual in drag. 
These behind-the-scenes details shed light on the film's evolution and the diverse roles undertaken by key actors, contributing to the overall cinematic experience. Imagine a place where even the breaks between filming scenes become part of the movie magic. Back in 1968, during the making of a certain film, the monkeys found themselves wandering aimlessly around the studio during downtime. To fix this, they set up a special room, complete with colorful lights, where they could chill out, study their lines, write music, and have a smoke away from the prying eyes of the set. Those lights weren't just for ambience, they also acted as a signal for when it was time to get back to work. In one memorable dance scene, Davy Jones teams up with Tony Bezel, who not only shows off her dancing skills, but also helps choreograph the whole routine. Interestingly, Tony Bezel would later hit it big with a song called Mickey in 1982 which some say is a nod to one of the monkeys. Adding a personal touch to the film, Linda Haynes, who would later become Davy Jones' wife, pops up as a guest at a party scene. Her appearance gives the movie a little extra connection to real life. These little glimpses behind the scenes give us a special peek into how the film was made, showing us what the monkeys got up to when they weren't in front of the camera. Each part, from the makeshift lounge to the personal connections between the cast, helps give the movie its unique flavor. Imagine stepping into a lively scene at Paramount Pictures where Michael Nesmith's birthday bash is happening. The setting, borrowed from Rosemary's Baby, is bustling with 100 extra people, including the famous artist Edward Keenhals and his striking sculpture backseat Dodge 38. Nesmith, known for always wearing his wool cap during his monkey's days, surprisingly goes without it, marking a change in his on-screen persona. Meanwhile, Mickey Dolenz finds himself in the Bahamas, shooting an exciting underwater rescue scene with mermaids. These contrasting moments in the film head give viewers a peek into the different adventures and personalities of the characters. Marking the debut of two new talents in 1968, the film introduced Helena Kalinioz and Chelsea Brown to the industry. Surprisingly, it received a G rating from the MPAA during its theatrical release, making it accessible to a broader audience. However, this wasn't enough for success, as later Mickey Dolenz implied on the monkeys that the R rating may have contributed to its poor box office performance. This restriction kept underage fans from experiencing the film on the big screen. Five years after its premiere, a 1973 Rayburg retrospective, featuring it alongside other notable films like Five Easy Pieces and Easy Rider became a turning point. The retrospective garnered positive responses from both fans and critics, finally acknowledging its significance. It seems that the movie needed time to gain the recognition it deserved, finding its place among other classics in retrospect. In summary, despite initial struggles, the movie secured a lasting spot in film history thanks to the later appreciation it received in retrospectives. The journey from an underrated release to a revered classic reflects the unpredictable trajectory of cinematic success. Did you know that in the late 1960s, there was a movie that caused quite a stir? It had some interesting connections to famous people and events of that time. For instance, there's a line in the film that came from a comedy show in the 1930s. Also, there are rumors floating around about a possible sequel with a catchy marketing slogan that teases audiences. Before the movie, there was a funny moment involving one of the actors and a famous musician hinting at their future collaboration. All these little details add up to make the movie story even more interesting. It's like a puzzle with unexpected connections and a mix of different talents coming together. In one scene, Peter Tork whistles Strawberry Fields Forever by the Beatles upon entering the restroom. Meanwhile, Dennis Hopper, known for his role in Head, provided narration for the gorilla's song fire coming out of the monkey's head. The opening sequence, featuring the mayor on a bridge, starkly illustrates the severe smog levels that engulfed Los Angeles in the late 60s, setting the stage for the movie's themes. This film blends footage of John Brockman and the Radio City Riquettes with scenes from several classic movies, including Gilda, Golden Boy, Jam Session, Salem, and The Black Cat. The movie premiered on the CBS Late Movie on December 30, 1974, coinciding with Michael Nesmith's 32nd birthday and Davy Jones' 29th. It was aired again on July 7, 1975, also on CBS. The floating silver pillows and the cop's dream pay homage to Andy Warhol's floating silver pillows. Pauline Kael, a renowned film critic for The New Yorker, left the theater an hour into the movie. She later briefly reviewed the part she watched. Co-writer Jack Nicholson took over compiling the movie's soundtrack, adding snippets of dialogue between songs. He was credited for this on the LP album cover. Nicholson was enthusiastic about the film, even joining a campaign to promote its premiere. 
He claimed to have watched it numerous times and loved it. A misleading ad campaign featuring John Brockman's face and no mention of the monkeys along with a poorly timed release date likely contributed to the film's box office failure. It made only $16,11 in ticket sales. In several scenes of the film, only three of the monkeys are visible together, leaving the fourth monkey entirely out of the frame. This deliberate choice nods to the concept of the three wise monkeys see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil. Near the film's start, a mermaid kisses all four monkeys in reverse order to their actual deaths, Dolenz, Nesmith, Tork, and Jones. A distinctive feature of the movie is the absence of opening credits, an unusual move for a 1960s film. Instead, all credits appear at the film's conclusion. This unique blend of visual symbolism and unconventional presentation adds layers to the narrative, giving the audience subtle cues and challenging traditional cinematic norms. In the late 1960s, a film premiered at the Cannes Film Festival, ahead of another well-known movie. Producers faced worries that the involvement of a famous band might not appeal to serious critics and audiences. To address this, they promoted the film while downplaying its connection to the band. One member of the band, tasked with playing the role of the drummer, committed himself to daily drum lessons to appear skilled on camera. Although he managed live performances, recording in the studio posed challenges, leading him to pass on the drumming duties on subsequent albums to studio musicians after recording every track for the movie's soundtrack. This unique approach to promotion and the drummer's role in both live and recorded music capture the distinct dynamic behind the film. In the 60s, Ed brought together the monkeys and the counterculture, leaving a lasting mark. Tony Bezel, known for Hey Mickey, choreographed and appeared in the film alongside Davy Jones. On the first day of shooting, Peter Tork was the sole monkey present, as the others protested not being allowed creative control. This move fractured their relationship with the producers irreparably. Coca-Cola took offense to a scene featuring a desert wanderer and a soda machine, but the issue faded over time. Ed's legacy endures, showcasing a clash between commercialism and artistic freedom. Following his final performance in Head, Sam Flint, aged 86 at the time of the film's release, continued to live for another 12 years. Victor Mature, perplexed by the script, found humor in its nonsensical nature, accepting the role of the big victor. This character is speculated to be a satirical poke at RCA Victor, the distributors of the Monkees records, whose parent company also owned NBC, the network that aired their TV series. Interestingly, Mature's attire in the film closely mirrors his costume from Timbuktu, a connection made more intriguing by the fact that both films feature George Dolenz, father of Mickey Dolenz. When Mature's character manifests in the bathroom mirror, the outfit resemblance is uncanny, tying these cinematic worlds together in an unexpected way. In the late 1960s, an interesting link formed between two movies that would become famous in film history. It all started when a producer who worked with a popular band met some talented actors and decided to collaborate on a project. This producer, known for his work with the Monkees, joined forces with actors like Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, and Peter Fonda. Together, they came up with the idea for a movie called Easy Rider. They got the backing they needed from Columbia Pictures, the studio behind the Monkees, but there was a catch. Columbia wanted another movie featuring the Monkees in return for helping with Easy Rider. So, the producer agreed, and with the help of Nicholson, they made a movie called Head, which was inspired by the Monkees' world. Once the movie Head was finished, the producer moved on to bigger projects, leaving the Monkees behind. This shift marked the beginning of his move to larger movies, starting with Easy Rider. So, in a way, the making of Head and the success of Easy Rider were connected, linking the producer with the actors in a unique collaboration that had an impact on the film industry. In a memorable scene, a character portrayed by Frank Zappa delivers a dark and pessimistic monologue about the future of America, leaving a lasting impression on viewers. This moment in the movie reflects the societal issues of the late 1960s, highlighting the turbulent times of that era. Despite its initial reception, the movie has gained a dedicated following for its unconventional storytelling and satirical portrayal of the entertainment industry. It features a series of disjointed vignettes blurring reality, an illusion offering a surreal exploration of fame, identity, and disillusionment. Directed by Bob Ravelson and written by Ravelson and Jack Nicholson, it defies traditional storytelling, opting for a collage-like approach, mirroring the fragmented nature of celebrity culture. The movie stars the Monkees, a band created for a television series, rebelling against their manufactured image and striving for artistic authenticity. 
Filled with psychedelic imagery, surreal sequences, and experimental editing, it captures the spirit of the counterculture movement. Its bold experimentation and sharp social commentary continue to engage audiences, cementing its status as a cult classic. Despite its initial commercial setback, the movie has been reevaluated positively for its innovative storytelling and subversive commentary on fame and media manipulation. Today, it stands as an example of the creative freedom of its era and remains an engaging and thought-provoking piece of cinema. In a rather unexpected turn, one of the lesser known but poignant aspects of the 1968 film arises from the fate of its co-writer, Jack Nicholson. Despite his later success in Hollywood, Nicholson faced a disheartening reality during the production of Head. While working on the script, Nicholson grappled with personal demons, battling a divorce and financial strain. This period marked a challenging chapter in his life, a stark contrast to the eventual recognition he would receive in the industry. As the film explores various themes and genres delving into the surreal and psychedelic, it's a sobering fact that one of its creators faced significant struggles behind the scenes. This adds a layer of depth to the movie as the audience witnesses not just the on-screen narrative, but also the human struggles that permeated the creative process. The challenges faced by Nicholson during the creation of Head shed light on the less glamorous side of the film industry, serving as a reminder that even in the midst of artistic exploration, individuals grapple with personal hardships. This underlines the complexity and humanity behind the seemingly glossy facade of the entertainment world. In retrospect, Nicholson's journey during the making of Head stands as a testament to the resilience required in the face of personal adversities. His later success in the film industry serves as a stark contrast to the challenging period he endured during the movie's production, underscoring the unpredictable nature of the creative journey. In an unexpected turn, the 1968 movie took a somber route behind the scenes. During the production, tragedy struck as one of the crew members, a dedicated cinematographer, met with a fatal accident on set. The incident cast a shadow over the otherwise dynamic and unconventional filming process. Amidst the vibrancy of its experimental narrative and unconventional structure, this behind-the-scenes tragedy serves as a poignant reminder of the risks and challenges inherent in filmmaking. The loss of a crew member working diligently to bring the vision to life adds a layer of sorrow to the production history. Despite the groundbreaking nature of the work and the creative risk taken, the untimely death on set remains an indelible, sobering moment in its tale. It underscores the real-world consequences that can accompany artistic endeavors, even in the pursuit of pushing boundaries. Navigating through the movie's production, this tragic incident stands out as a reminder of the unpredictable nature of filmmaking, where the line between creativity and harsh realities can sometimes blur unexpectedly. In the world of cinema, the movie stands as a testament not only to its avant-garde storytelling, but also to the sacrifices made by those behind the scenes whose efforts often go unnoticed in the final product. It's a story with many layers, leaving a lasting impact on its legacy.